Okay, so I think we're... we're... Sunday, I send you an unrolled version of Loner's Thread. Ah, oh, beautiful. Okay. The Cookie Files. The recent guy... I can't do a Loner Box voice. The re... The recent go I how do you do a loner box voice? I need to like I need to like put like a, a a stent in my nose or something. The recent gauze and cookie debate is a perfect example of how stupid this propaganda game can get. In this case, both on the part of the Omni Liberal and Omar Badar. A thread on the Gaza blockade, how it changed over time, and why the fuck we're talking about cookies. For any measure, Israel takes against Palestinians, pro-Israel people will reflexively say it had to have been done for legitimate security reasons. Well, pro-Palestinians default to the opposite. The only purpose was to inflict suffering. Okay, but if there's not a legitimate security reason, you're out of options, really. Um, I guess whimsy? Israel had imposed partial restrictions on Gaza after the disengagement in 2005. In 2007, after the Hamas takeover, they imposed an indefinite blockade on the Strip. On paper, the blockade measures were intended to stop weapons and dual-use items from entering. Well, there you go. Because what counts as a dual-use item is practically endless. It's a massive list. It was immediately clear that a lot of the prohibited items had no discernible military use. Some denied items included books, clothes, toys, tea, coffee, milk, and most baking products. Over the next three years, some items, for example, pasta and toilet paper, were slowly allowed in. That, that is punitive. It is true that sugar along with potassium nitrate was used as propellant for Qasem rockets, but it is very unlikely that cookies were ever used for this purpose, although it is technically possible. I don't actually know about that. Not least of all because raw sugar was seemingly never banned from Gaza. So this is what actually happened. Lonerbox saw the debate on breaking points, and he did the smart thing. See, people like Wick didn't. They're stupid. Lonerbox did the smart thing, and he watched. And he watched to see what the reaction was. And when people jumped on the cookie thing, he's like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna... I'm gonna middle the road this. I'm not gonna jump in defending Steven. I'm gonna show how actually we're all getting it wrong. Because if we're all getting it wrong, this is no longer a moral or, or a, a strategic blunder on the part of one of the parties. This is just a part of the human condition. Anyone, anyone would have made this mistake. Between 2007 and 2010... <sighs> No list of banned items was ever made public, nor was any justification given for such seemingly arbitrary and punitive measures. In 2009, one Israeli official told Haaretz, we don't want Gilad, Gilad Shalit's captors to be munching Bamba right over his head. That's a punitive statement. In mid-2010, the flotilla incident threw Israel's blockade measures into the spotlight and forced them to change course. Within weeks, most of the quote-unquote banned Most of the banned consumer items, including cookies, started entering the Strip. So why were cookies banned in the first place? Well, in late 2010, Gisha, Israeli Human Rights Org, managed to provide some insight. It turns out the Ministry of Defense had issued a white list of accepted goods. Almost anything that wasn't on this list was denied, although there was no formal blacklist. Previously, Gisha had collaborated with Gazan traders and orgs to deduce which items were allowed and which were prohibited. Interestingly, cookies aren't mentioned. But there is a caveat on biscuits and chocolate, which were only partially blocked, i.e. never fully banned. The cookie dough thickens. There is at least one company, Sereo Al Wadia, which produces cookies and has been operating in Gaza since 1985. This doesn't matter, this has to do with exports. In other words, I have seen no evidence that Gazans were forced to go without cookies for three years. That's irrelevant. That's really irrelevant. Um, the point is, the blockades were punitive. The point is, the blockades banned uh, made it impossible to import basic necessities of a human level of life for no conceivable strategic reason. And Stephen, Destiny, in the debate with Amar on breaking points, without even knowing what the bans were, assumed that it must be for military purposes because... His job in that debate was to do nothing but excuse anything Israel does. Car like, blanketly. That's it. That's the problem. So, what this thread does, and what's really disgusting about this, because this has been, this has been Lonerbox's shtick throughout this whole conflict. Um, tag along, be the voice of reason, quote-unquote, but endear yourself to Destiny by covering for him in this way. If he fucks up, if pro-Israel apologists fuck up, reconstrue it 
as just a little a little problem that we're all having. This is just a really complicated, a really complicated issue, guys. We're all just struggling to come to terms with it. Here, let me let me readjust course a little bit so we 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 understand how we're all actually at fault. No, we're not all actually at fault. This is where the score actually stands. You have on the one side people who are protesting the mass crushing of the skulls of children. There are photos proliferating on Twitter right now of of like elementary school children with their eyeballs popping out of their skulls. Okay? And on the and on the other side, uh, you have people who are taking any conceivable line, stretching farther than Michael Jordan in Space Jam to justify that continuing endlessly. Every past instance and every future instance. And there's no conceivable end or purpose to it, except it gets them a lot of money and clicks from people who just really really want to see Arab children dead. Truly, that's it. Um, and the, the grand crime on the protesters' side in this case is that, oh, they didn't have an encyclopedic knowledge of the precise nature of the cookie restrictions in the Gaza blockade. Great. Great job, loner. And here we go again. You'll notice, after all this, no mention of destiny. No mention of destiny justifying the banning of cookies for their use in weapons. Although he does say, oh, it's technically possible. By the way, it's technically not possible. And here's why. Even if you can metaphysically conceive, even if you can scientifically figure out a way, which you can, to extract sugar from baked goods, what's technically possible in this case when you're talking about the, the construction of weapons is not the ability to get a, 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 a tiny quantity of usable sugar from a baked good. What you need to achieve for this to be technical, technically possible, the technical task that you are set as a, as a weapon builder is you need to make the extraction of sugar from these cookies efficient. You need to be able to get enough sugar from these cookies that the cost of extracting them is significantly less than the fuel you get from it. By the way, uh, how, how would you, how do you, uh, how do you extract sugar from cookies? How would you do so? How would you do so without, for example, heat? Like you, you would, you would need, you would need to expend fuel to do this. You need to expend manpower to do this. You suck it out. Exactly. Exactly. That's it. I talked about this last stream. They have a great underground cisterns in their tunnels. They're like the uh, the water wells in Dune. They just spit in there, and the cookies just dissolve, and they just have a little net. They just scoop the sugar off. Though this makes sense, I don't think it rules out, and this is where we were at in the debate, I don't think it rules out the punitive aspect. As mentioned above, it's undeniable that some Israeli officials either wanted Gazans to suffer or just didn't care. It's undeniable that some Israeli officials given how easily they were able to lift the restrictions in the face of international there's a pressure here we go they clearly could have done something sooner but didn't it may not have been their explicit aim to punish the population but the measures absolutely had that effect and no one seemed to mind until they were forced to notice how it's all passive it wasn't their aim it wasn't their explicit aim they just you know they just didn't notice so it's switched in this conversation it's been reframed as they did this punitively to uh oh Oh, really? We banned all that stuff? Damn. Why are you making such a fuss about this? Okay, fine, fine. In 2013, Gisha obtained a full list of restricted items from the Ministry of Defense. Anything not mentioned was free to be imported. This updated list has a few contentious items, but none as trivial as anything from 2007 to 2010. Cookie Gate was over. This all leads me to wonder... Why is Amar talking about a cookie ban, which, if it was ever even fully in place, hasn't existed for nearly 15 years, as if this is the quintessential blockaded item in Gaza? Well, because it's an illustration of the cartoonish hatred that motivates the blockade in the first place. Th that's why. We're talking about motive. We're talking about your purpose here. We're talking about whether your ultimate aim is actually peace in the region, or whether you have an additional one that's unstated, which is the destruction of the people who live there. Is it because this is his way of avoiding any conversation about the weapons? Well, that's interesting. Because it seems like the conversation immediately shifted to the weapons by way of the cookies. That was the justification Stephen gave. Does he say anything about that here? Does he mention Stephen? 
Destiny did look silly responding to a claim about cookies by talking about sugar and rockets. It seems he started with the assumption that there had to be a security justification for any blockaded item and just dug in there, eventually admitting the blockade was too harsh. Omar seems to have started with the assumption that every Israeli action is driven by a sinister intent to hurt Palestinians for no reason. Well, no, there is a very clear reason. There's a very clear reason. Uh, a lot of children are raised in Israel to hate Arabs. Um, there are nets. When there are settler houses at higher levels and Arab houses at lower levels, there are nets to prevent people from throwing things down at them. Um, when there is a, a largely peaceful protest, the presence of Hamas, which at this time is the government, the presence of Hamas, or the presence of a, a, a vast minority of people who are approaching a fence or throwing rocks or whatever, is taken as license to shoot Something to the tune of, off the top of my head, I think it's like 1,300 people had multiple bullets in them. Actually, I think I have this pulled up right here, don't I? Uh, yeah, here we go. We can actually, whoa, what, what, how fortuitous, I have it already up. Um, at least 189 palace, okay, we'll just read the whole thing. Most of the demonstrations, uh, demonstrators demonstrated peacefully, far from the border fence. Peter Kamak, a fellow with the Middle East program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, argued that the march indicated a new trend in Palestinian society and Hamas, with a shift away from violence towards non-violent forms of protest. Nevertheless, groups consisting mainly of young men approached the fence and attempted to breach it, skirmishing with Israeli soldiers by rolling tires and throwing stones and Molotov cocktails. Israeli officials, Israeli officials said the demonstrations were used by Hamas as cover for launching attacks against Israel. Tires. At least 189 Palestinians were killed between 30th of March and 31st, December 2018. An independent United Nations commission set the number of known militants killed at 29 out of the 189. Other officials claim a higher figure of at least 40. Israeli soldiers fired tear gas and live ammunition. According to Robert Mardini, head of Middle East for the International Committee of the Red Cross, more than 13,000 Palestinians were wound wounded. Did I say 1,300? 13,000 Palestinians were wounded as of 19th uh, June 2018. The majority were wounded severely with some, that's what I'm thinking, 1,400, with some 1,400 struck by three to five bullets. No Israelis were physically harmed from 30th of March to 12th of May until one Israeli soldier was reported as slightly wounded on 14th of May. Slightly wounded. The day the protests peaked. The same day, 59 or 60 Palestinians were shot dead at 12 clash points along the border fence. A mosque claimed 50 of them as its militants, and Islamic Jihad claimed three of the 62 killed as members of its military wing. Some 35,000 Palestinians protested that day, with thousands approaching the fence. Israel's use of deadly force was condemned on 13th of June 2018 in a United Nations General Assembly resolution. Con condemnations also came from human rights organizations, including Human Rights Watch, B'Tselem, and Amnesty International, and by United Nations officials. Um, the Israeli government praised Israeli troops for protecting the border fence. Yeah, so this is, this is uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is a naked apology for ethnically targeted brutality. Bluntly, like... I guess a 14-year-old cookie story is more relevant than the fact that Hamas were importing and repurposing whatever they could to launch attacks which do absolutely nothing to help their population apart from what? A few more dead and scared Israelis? Well, what happens to the economy of one of the most densely packed places on Earth when you cut off trade? Remember, the one case that you mentioned, uh, like cookies, were was from an exporter. They couldn't export. What happens to them? Well, you have mass poverty. You have a you have the 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 decline of services. You have a decline in the capacity to do... They didn't have toilet paper for a while, okay? What happens when you have mass poverty? You have mass death and hopelessness. You have people l losing losing the ability to, to, to function like human beings. You have people dying because they can't get treatments. You have people uh, in, in various states of malnourishment. You have people who have absolutely no hope whatsoever. And lo and behold... There's a, a, a foreign-funded terrorist organization that happens to be running the government that's looking for recruits. Boom. 